Hello, I'm Pastor Dave, and this is our pre-recorded sermon for April 24th, 2022. This is a sermon that I've entitled, What Do We Do Now? And this is based on the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. And I would invite you to pause this right now and view this, and then come back and listen to the message. But let's begin. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be worthy in your sight. Amen. So at this point, Easter is behind us. And now we are in the season of Easter, which marks the 50 days between the resurrection and the day of Pentecost. And nothing really has changed since last week. The paramounts in the church are still white. We still sing Easter hymns. For those of us with kids, the Easter candy should still be in the house. And we may even still have some leftovers from the Easter meal in our refrigerator, though that might not be too good of a thing. Basically, the Easter bunny is gone. What do we do with Easter now? I have to wonder if the disciples thought the same. They had the news of the resurrection. And in our account from the Gospel of John today, we have Jesus appearing to them. This is great news. Jesus is back from the dead. But I have to wonder if they knew what they were supposed to do with that information. They knew he was there. What could they do with it? And then Thomas, who until he saw Jesus, wasn't even going to believe. This is a familiar situation for us because what do we do with the same information? What do we do with the knowledge that Christ is back from the dead? Well, this morning... I don't want to answer that question. To start, we need to remember that we are needed. Jesus needs the church to reach all people. During the time Jesus was on earth, teaching, healing, engaging in his ministry, he had a l limited reach, and that was because of being in human form. He could only travel so far. He had his 12 core disciples and 70 full-time disciples and a bunch of people who came and went. But really, his earthly ministry was primarily confined to Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. And that was the physical limitations. He didn't really, in those three years, spread it throughout the Roman world. That was something that was only possible after the resurrection. Because then the disciples, ultimately at the day of Pentecost, would come to understand and could go out and preach that was why Pentecost is so important. It's the birth of the church, the whole global church. And that's really the purpose of the church and the disciples throughout history. We are Christ's representatives on earth. And those who paid any attention to the Tony Evans study would remember that phrase. We are the outreach tool of Christ in the physical world. We are the visible and physical ministry of Christ in the world. And that's... A good thing because there are some who will struggle to believe in what they cannot see or touch and we're supposed to be that face of christ that ambassador for christ in this world in many ways we need to reach out to the thomases of the world and be the light for them but this is not a one-way relationship either because the church needs jesus for the message and power i mean this goes back to the historic mission of the church I mean, from the day of Pentecost, we were empowered by the Holy Spirit, so that's where the power comes from. But we also have the mission Christ gave to us to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them what he taught us. That's what we are called to do. And that sets us apart from other entities that do the same thing. I mean, we could be a book club, but they're secular book clubs. You can be a philosophical society and debate theology. There are philosophical societies in the world. We could be an aid society, but there are plenty of secular aid societies who do a good job of what they do. What sets the church apart isn't those activities, but literally the fact that we have that higher purpose. And everything else kind of ties into that higher purpose. It, that higher purpose to do what Christ taught us to do, to clothe the naked, feed the hungry, visit the lonely and the imprisoned. 
all that stuff has that higher purpose of making disciples and to spread Christ's teachings. Everything fulfills that mission. That's why we were empowered by the Holy Spirit to do it. We were empowered to do it for a reason. And in doing so, we tap into that grace of God that's already at work in people's lives and help them respond to God's grace that's already there, that's already given to them. And this is really a wonderful two-way relationship between the church and Christ. We need Christ, and Christ needs us to do the work. So that's really part of who we are. But what we do with it is actually important. It helps answer that question, what do we do with all this? We know it. We hear it. We have that information, but what now? Well, one of the first steps is we need to actually be like Thomas. Because like Thomas, we need to understand before we talk. This is a very underrated thing. Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi once noted the ability to talk does not make one intelligent. And there is some truth to that because some people can talk and never say anything. If you want some fun, watch some political debates or some press conferences and you just see the spin where they're talking, but they're actually not saying anything. That's part of the difference between talking and actually understanding. And that's something that's important for the church, that as we engage, as we fulfill that mission Christ sets upon us, as we respond to Easter, it's we need to be like Thomas and not so much in doubting, but seeking to understand what actually happened. So we're not just saying it, but we can engage with it. In many ways, because of my love of history, this does remind me of a famous American general named Stonewall Jackson. Now, in fairness, I respect his martial abilities. His Shenandoah Valley campaign was utterly spectacular in what he was able to do. However, I'm not a Stonewall Jackson fanboy. And I say this for a variety of reasons, because I know, you know, he was human and not perfect, especially the cause for which he fought was far from perfection. I also know that I have relatives who were on the other side who would be shooting back at him. That's part of it as well. But it also goes back to the point that if you look at enough of his writings and enough of his letters, you start to realize that he was borderline certifiably insane. And part of this we can actually see before the Civil War. Before the war, Jackson was a professor at the Virginia, at the Virginia Military Institute, where to this day he's held in very high regard and has a full museum there. And they have some of his items there including the chalkboard from his classroom. I always found that interesting because, well, you can say he was a great field commander. He was not a good professor. He was not a good teacher. What he actually taught were artillery tactics and mathematics, which are and were then and very much are now, so very much related. The thing is, when he taught these young men, he lectured. The catch was he had his lectures memorized word for word and when someone had a question and sought clarification so they could understand what he was trying to teach he couldn't explain it in a different way he would literally go back and repeat repeat it word for word you see this in the movie gods and generals where they take it in a different light saying that he'll since they could understand he'll just repeat it word for word the next day it wasn't that he was a great teacher. He was actually a pretty horrible teacher because it almost seemed like he didn't fully understand the topics enough to explain it in a different way to different people. And I bring that up because in many ways, that's one of the struggles we have. You can walk out these doors today and say Christ is risen, but you have to be able to understand it to explain it. And this harkens back to a difficult truth for some of the church, and that is the accumulation of knowledge is not the point of the church. Now, don't get me wrong. Knowledge is good. I got books upon books off to my right at the moment that are basically full of knowledge of the Bible, of theology, the hymns of the church, scripture, missing other writing, historic writings, you name it. It's there, and the study is good. 
we're doing it for the higher purpose. Now, if it's just so that we have knowledge, so we can win at Bible trivia or seem smart, that's not the point. The point of accumulating the knowledge is to grow to understand God better to and love God, God more. And really to start to try to understand God so we can teach the faith and spread the faith. That's actually the point, not just the accumulation of knowledge and degrees. And that's one of the things with Easter. When we think back into the Easter gospel, in this case, we'll, this year we're looking at John chapter 20. We had the disciples going to the tomb, kind of spreading that news that Christ is risen, really more or less amongst themselves. So they knew what happened. They had the knowledge. They could repeat that knowledge to someone else, but they were struggling to actually understand what happened. We see that repeatedly that they, you see it in the Easter gospel, they didn't understand. We see it in Thomas going, how did Jesus come back? We say it's doubting, but he's acting like every other person would have. Like, what do you mean he's back from the dead? I saw him die. He was in a tomb. How is he back? Even hearing the knowledge, he did not understand. And that is something about our faith. I mean, we could memorize the creeds, not just the Apostles' Creed. We could look at all of them. We could have them memorized. We can sing hymns from memory. We can memorize Scripture so we can repeat it word for word with book, chapter, and verse. But what does that gain you just for the sheer knowledge of being able to do it? Is it another crown we lay at the throne of God? Yeah, but how does that help do what Christ asks of us to do? How do we take that, some could say, self-centered view of faith, of accumulating more understanding, and share it to fulfill the work of the church? Really, all this does start with us. And it starts to answer that question of, what do we do with all of this? What do we do now that Easter's over? Christ is risen. What now? It's actually a very simple answer. Believe. Jesus Christ, through faith, the church, and knowledge, gives life to those who believe. Yes, we are saved by our faith in Jesus Christ. But the church of believers living their faith helps others grow in knowledge and also in understanding of the faith. And as the church, this really should be something we strive for because as we can do this, we become faithful witnesses to Christ on earth and are able to do more than just tell the gospel, but help others understand so they too can believe. In many ways, I do feel sorry for Thomas. That phrase, don't be a doubting Thomas, is a constant reminder of him being human. Because Thomas was human. He heard the message, and even if he knew that it could happen, he struggled to understand and processing all of it. He wanted to see it and touch it. And truth be told, who doesn't want to do that in this society? Who doesn't want to, who doesn't say pictures or it didn't happen? I mean, do you believe every fishing story you hear about how big the fish was? No, that's why everyone carries cameras so they can prove how big it was. We do struggle to believe what we do not see. Even if we hear it. Which is why we can't just have the knowledge, but we must understand it, what happened. So we can better understand Christ, better understand God, better understand how the Holy Spirit is at work in us. And really, that is our task today. We are to believe, and as we believe, come to understand. Because once we understand, we can preach, we can teach, we can spread the gospel and fulfill that mission that Christ has set beyond the scope of time for the church. But it all starts with that first step, with answering that question of what do we do with it now? It's very easy. What do we do with Easter? We believe. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are people that often struggle with belief. We want proof. We want evidence. And even when we hear something that's true, we can struggle to understand. But help us to truly make that first step with the knowledge of our resurrected Lord, which is to believe. Have that belief be our starting point, that we can continue to grow as we accumulate knowledge, but also an understanding of you. 
so we may be your faithful representatives on earth and lead others back to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This is, as always, our pre-recorded sermon. The full service is available on the East Salem UMC Facebook page. We live stream it at 8.45 on Sunday morning, and we keep it there afterwards if you would like the full service. But otherwise, we're still here on YouTube. But until next time, I'm Pastor Dave, and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.